All right, so I'll give you a little bit of background about what this is. I'm David Edwards. I've been trading with Quantopian for a, a couple of years now, at least since they started the live trading. I was one of the early adopters of the platform and have been working out here in Boston for the summer. And this was a end of summer wrap up talk for I did internally of how do how do quants go about developing strategies on the platform and then more specifically about the integration of the research environment and the things that that brings to the table that couldn't be done before. Because uh, in my opinion, the research environment is really where the power of Quantopian's entire infrastructure lies. So uh, with that said, here's the overview of how at least I go about finding strategies and then trying to figure out how plausible they are, whether or not I should implement it, so sort of the workflow that I go by. So step one, obviously look for an idea, find one, and the places I'll look are generally go to academia or my own intuition. So it's you have some hypothesis about how markets work or some scenario where you think you can generate profits just from patterns that you've seen in your own experience. And then next, you have to either go replicate the results from the paper or create your own results. And then comes three, and three shows up a lot. So you don't need to do your plausibility check. So it's like, okay, what? how realistic is this trading strategy? The things you're going to want to look at are like, how long do I have to hold each position for? How quickly does this signal de decay? Um, how much is it going to cost to implement? Do I have the amount of money necessary to be able to effectively uh, use this strategy? And none of the things like capacity, do I have too much money and it's not worth me throwing anything at it? And then if it doesn't pass any of those, basically throw it out, start over, back to the drawing board. And then... Once you've got your initial plausibility, like, okay, I think this could work, you have to design an algorithm and begin to back test it. And taking the results, go back to three, do the entire uh, uh, three sequence again, look at things like changing various parameters, like holding periods and things like that, um, and look at what happens to it. And if you get good results from that, then it's make it your own. That's where you apply any of your own intuitive, you know, order management things to try to mitigate the risk and all the little things like handling orders that didn't go through. And once you've done that, paper trading. Paper trading is a pretty important one. How long you're going to paper trade, I feel like is a highly dependent on the style of strategy. If it's a really long-term, uh, low turnover strategy, it's, it can be tough to paper trade just because it takes a long time for it to go through a few cycles. You really want the, like if it's a pairs trading uh, algorithm, you're going to want the pairs to go through a few cycles of you know buy and sell and make sure that it flushes out any of those bugs that might show up depending on what's going on. And if it, completely fails within paper trading, you probably just had a model that was overfit and you should go back to the drawing board or at least go back to the uh, designing of the algorithm and you know, make sure that you're uh, still happy with the model. And then also live trading with low stakes is what I would do next. So live trading with uh, low stakes is where all the things that can go wrong, do go wrong, and that's where you find the real bugs. Paper trading can only really tell you so much. Uh, things like borrowing costs on short sells and uh, you know, non-fills, and then also your, get your actual results as far as your slippage and transactions, what kind of market impact am I having, and is the are the bid-ask spreads too wide for these pairs or whatever this kind of strategy is. And from there, you're going to take your actual results and go back and compare them with your back-tested estimations. And 
that's where you'll get a good idea of how conservative you are being. You can start to develop your own slippage models accordingly. And if it gets through all of that, you're going to allocate some capital to it, add it to your portfolio of strategies, and start completely over. So in my opinion, the beauty of algorithmic trading is that it takes the mechanics of the day-to-day -day trading completely off the table, which allows you to scale your operation really well. Just because I, if I have one strategy and I have to implement it manually, I'm not able to continue to do research. But if I can automate that execution, I can go back to the drawing board while that is on autopilot, develop a whole new strategy, and then allocate more capital to that one and repeat. So that's a, a way to diversify as well. So having multiple strategies going, hopefully they're not in drawdowns at the same time. And then the real beauty is that it, it scales well. Once you've written the code, put it on autopilot, monitor it, and then always go back and make sure it's still behaving as intended. All right, so for this particular talk, I went to academia and looked for a paper and I'm using a high frequency trading model. Um, it's definitely not feasible to trade this kind of a strategy on Quantopian or through any retail account, but it does highlight a lot of the things that can go wrong and should be looked at. So I think it's a pretty good example for what I was trying to get done here. So here's an abstract of the abstract of the paper. So it's basically show evidence that there are opportunities to generate alpha in the high frequency environment in the US equities. And they use principal component analysis of the log returns to uh, basically make short term predictions about market movements. And it's rough within the paper. They say one minute to five minutes is the uh, frequency of the tr uh, strategy. And the biggest assumption they make is that you get instant fills at the mid price. So you know, they used bid ask or bid plus ask divided by two as their proxy for the price and assume that they're always going to get that fill. All right, so on to replicating the model. Rather than using the stocks in the paper, I believe they used a random batch of 50 or so uh, S&P 500 equities. I just went with a basket of ETFs. Um, we're not able to exactly replicate their results in this case because they're using tick level data and Quantopian has the minute bars, but we should be able to get similar findings. So obviously get your pri um, download some prices. I did from 2010, uh, end of 2010 to the beginning of 2011 and using minute prices. So this is a pretty good sample size as far as the um, number of bars we have to work with. And then obviously just plotting, kind of get an idea for what it is you're looking at. And then comes the fun piece, which is doing the math. And definitely thank God for NumPy, Pandas, SK Learn. All those things are such a lifesaver. I can't imagine having to write all of this code from the get-go. So what this function here is doing, get PCA spreads, it accepts a few arguments. So prices, obviously, just the raw, uh, raw prices data frame. And then end components is going to be your number of principal components that you keep in order to use as risk factors. Um, and then it's taking those first few components, doing a regression against them, and assuming that they are explanatory they explain the majority of the risk factors in the market and then it's going to basically get a spread between the regression like how what is the residual from where it normally would be and then so it is returning the log returns and then minus the estimation and that's going to be the spread. So if it's uh, above zero, you would want to short it. If it's below zero, you would want to buy it. And then the very first thing, so I used cumulative returns to show this first plot, which is just the sum of the log returns. That's a really nice feature about using log prices is that you difference them and you've got your return series. 
And so this is just showing a another big mess of prices, basically. But at least it looks like they're centered around zero so that there could be some mean reversion that can be exploited here. And then the next thing is actually looking at the histogram of the returns. And I did this one for Delaney, who is doing a uh, course on quantitative finance at the moment. And so we wanted to do a normality test. This is using a Jacques Barra uh, stats models test for normality. And this p-value being 0.0, .0 .0 means it's not even close to normally distributed. But we already knew financial data is very rarely normally distributed. And since it's a reversion strategy, when you have reversions way out on the in the tails, that actually could be good because it implies that you're able to capture a larger reversion. So we're just going to go with it and go, OK, we knew it's not normal. So let's see what we can do anyways. So next is applying the transformation. So you just have to take the sign of the previous estimate and then multiply it by the next step returns. And that will transform your return series into your prediction, basically, where um, if it was above, I'm going to buy it. If it was uh, or if it was above, I'm going to sell it. If it's below, I'm going to buy it. And that's what comes out of this. So this looks like those same, let's go back up here. That took this batch of stocks and transformed them after applying the signals into this. So these are the post-trade equity curves, theoretically. And they all look pretty solid and go up and to the right, which is what we want. So it does seem like this concept holds water. And then this is the sum of all of them together. So this would be the theoretical returns on using this straight trading strategy in a perfect world where you get your fills and you're not paying to make any of the transactions. So it does look like this holds water. That's good. But it's got look ahead bias because I use the entire sample to fit the model and then apply the transformation. So this is not something you can do in real life. So the next thing you can do like a really simple naive back test, but just over a rolling window, I use the 500 minute rolling window, fit the model, take the last estimation and put those into a data frame and then do the same thing where I'm assuming immediate execution on these. So whenever, uh, for each, I'm applying it to the uh, return series without shifting it one forward, just assuming that I have this um, current current price and I'm just going to either buy or sell at that price, which is what they assume in the paper. And it still looks good. It looks a little bit messier, but that's expected because it wasn't using as much of a sample size and it was only getting that last last bar to go by and it still has this nice looking up and to the right almost dead straight returns but this is all well and good but what about things that can go wrong how can you then take a strategy like this and sort of see how quickly does this break down and how far can I push it before it just completely fails. And things are going to be like, okay, so holding period is a good one. So I'm using a function that's up here. Let's see. This make, make sign frame. So I'm taking the signals and then copying the sign, essentially, of each element. And then I can also add a step size. So if I wanted to do every five minutes, it would copy the sign of the first bar and then forward fill that through the next four and then do it again to the uh, fifth and forward fill that. So it's basically like just a naive way to simulate a, hold, a holding period. And after doing that, we end up with something that looks like this, where for the holding period of one, um, each, this legend here is the number of minutes that the strategy was holding for. And then, so your y-axis is the returns and then 
x-axis is the time steps in minutes. And as you can see, this has a pretty direct um, relationship as far as as you hold it longer, the signal does decay. And it seems to do it relatively quickly. And the next piece would be something like execution delay. What if I do the same thing, but rather than executing on the current bar, I, for some reason, don't get the fill and it goes through on the next bar? What happens there? And this one, almost immediately. So it, this is pretty highly dependent on being able to see a price, execute at that price, and not have any delay. And it looks like it almost immediately goes to into a range that is highly undesirable. And then some of the important stuff here, this is a slippage and turnover. So we all know that you're not gonna actually always be able to execute at that price. You might get a partial fill at that price and then the rest of it fills at a less desirable price and that's really common and gets more common the more capital you're trading. So this is just some stuff I stole from uh, Pifolio, which is actually going to be released in our research environment soon, just for um, it's an analysis library uh, to calculate things like sharp ratios and all that. So now taking the holding period series, this is applying a sharp ratio um, test to or see how as you hold longer, what happens to my sharp, and you can see it pretty much tanks, uh, starts going down, and it's below two by the time you get to 10 minutes. And then the fun stuff, adding slippage. So a common way to apply slippage is just take my return series. I'm going to assume some number of basis points, which are one one hundredth of a percent uh, of slippage, basically, that, it's, that I'm going to miss out on. And then subtracting that multiplied by the turnover of the strategy. Ooh, and I forgot to mention up in this holding period piece, I was also tracking the turnover. So I just used the uh, signals to generate weights and then figure out the, uh, use this function up here to get the turnover of the strategy. So Obviously, your turnover is going to get smaller as your holding period gets longer. And then after doing that, this is each one of those. So one minute, two minutes. The uh, legend here is the number of minutes held. And then your x-axis here is basis points of slippage. And the y-axis is the sharp ratio. So you can see as your slippage is increased, that the strategies are obviously going to make less money. But what's interesting about this is you get these intersections where, okay, now if I have 30 basis points of slippage, and if I find that that's the case in the market, then it is no longer desirable for me to trade at this one minute frequency. And it becomes more desirable to take it out to the two or three minutes. So you kind of get this nice little distribution of when is it like how good do my executions need to be before I consider trading at a higher frequency? And this is an interesting thing that you couldn't really do before with just looking at the uh, back test results and then going in, you would have to tweak the slippage parameter, run another back test, and then that can be a pain, but using the return series and then doing an after the fact, just, okay, let's get a distribution of how this looks, is something that the research platform makes really simple. And so then another cool feature we have now in research is this back test. So you, we have this function get back test and you can pass it a back test ID. And by the way, I shared this on the forum and here's the actual algorithm itself. And I have assumed, let's see. So this should be in the uh, webinar page. And if we go to the source code, all right, not working. Hmm. 
Okay, well, long story short is that I assumed no slippage and no transaction costs in this back test, which is why it looks like it does fairly well, sharp up near the seven range, which is really solid if you're actually getting your executions. Uh, next to no volatility, next to no drawdown, all well and good. Um, but what happens as soon as you do start to layer in costs? So what I've done here is got get back test turnover, which is actually going to get the daily turnover of the portfolio using all of your prices, uh, sizes. And then you're going to... Um, so it's basically going to be how much is my portfolio turning over relative to the value in the portfolio. And as you can see, the average turnover is 192 times the portfolio value in a day. So this thing's turning over its portfolio 190 times in a single day, which is probably going to be really expensive in practice. So now what if we apply slippage to this? So if we apply that same function where we're uh, adjusting for slippage over a range of slippages, and I believe I'm doing from zero to 60 basis points, you can see the sharp ratio immediately as soon as you add any slippage at all goes completely south. Um, and it actually gets better, it recovers, but that's interesting only because your money's all gone, so your volatility gets very low, so your sharp actually goes back up. And then the other interesting piece you can do is looking at commission cost sensitivity. So you can lump commissions in with slippage and assume they're part of that same cost. Uh, but it can also be useful to look at the commission in isolation. And what I've done here is taken the backtest uh, P&L and then applied several commission costs to the transactions where I'm just multiplying, assuming a per share transaction cost and then subtracting out the commissions and then plotting the average P&L over different uh, commission costs and you can see it very quickly crosses this zero line where if I'm paying you know, less than 0 0.0002 uh, cents per share that's you're gonna end up in the um, going to end up not making money very quickly using this sort of a high frequency trading strategy. And so even though I've used a high frequency example, I feel like it's good because it demonstrates a lot of the things that you should really be looking at and how can slippage and transaction costs affect my trading strategy. So if you have something like a pairs trading strategy where you're trying to figure out how long should I be holding these pairs? What kind of like window should I be using? And um, how quickly should I be turning them over? This sort of thing's really useful because if you're only getting like a $20 average turnaround on it, but you're paying, you know, 10 cents a share or something, does that completely negate your entire P&L stream? Are you going to end up making money? Um, and this is, why so much of the research in high frequency is about how to reduce transaction costs. Um, so for my opinion, using um, Quantopian's research platform opens up a whole new range of ways you can analyze algorithms, you can explore data and visualize things much easier. And then you can also do these sorts of sensitivity analysis, which was very difficult before when you just have to run a back test change some slippage or transaction cost settings, and then run another one. Um, but now you can get these nice gradients and plot them in unique ways and look at it from any angle you want. And that's really what I wanted to demonstrate here was that there's this nice little marriage of running the back test, being able to pull it in, analyze it, stress test it, and then um, go back and tweak your assumptions, you know, and find those settings that you think are more ideal. Um, and I don't really have anything else for you, so I think what I want to do is just open it up to questions and see uh, what you guys think and if I can help clear anything up for you. So go ahead and...
So you lost audio? <laughs> Can everybody hear me? Okay, good. Um, so do I have any questions? Let's see. Oh, here we go. So is there a link to the notebook? Yes, on the home page, if you go to the community, and it should be one of these very first ones. I would search webinar invite if it doesn't pop up. And I shared this notebook here. And I also shared the algorithm that goes along with it. I believe it makes something like 470,000 transactions over the course of this back test, which is only a few months. So it's probably gonna run pretty slow and it's really just for demonstration. Okay, so we've got a question here. What trading platforms do you use or suggest we might look at? Obviously, I'm gonna say Quantopian. I think they've built a really awesome product here. Um, and it also depends on what you're trying to trade. So right now we support US equities and then futures will be coming next. Uh, but if you're, and as far as brokerage, um, interactive brokers is, been pretty good they have a good cost structure and they're geared towards the retail quantitative trading and have a really nice API that you can hook up with so I would definitely suggest um, interactive brokers and then Quantopian is a good API to trade through interactive brokers and so I've got a question here about using multiple threads. So can you expand on that at all? So what is my conclusion? <laughs> That's another good question. My conclusion is basically that using Research this uh, IPython notebook. It's basically just an interactive session that allows you to analyze your algorithms in a much more uh, robust way and you can be much more creative and do these after the fact. Okay, what if I do, uh, apply slippage over a range of slippages, commissions over a range of commission, uh, commission costs and get these nice little, uh, so, a better way to look at the algorithm rather than doing a tweak and run a new back test. So. Oh, so. Computers will, with multiple cores can run processes in parallel. So I don't know. Yeah, you can't, you don't do much threading within the Quantopian algorithms. There's, it runs, we run on minute bar data. So we're not trying to compete with high frequency places. So the way it works is you define a single function or you can schedule them to occur at different time frames, And each minute you're going to get uh, your handle data function called and it's going to be passed whatever the current market data is and then you can do you do all your um, strategy implementation within that one minute so it's the it's on a cycle it's an event driven each minute we give you the fresh market data your algorithm makes a decision places orders and then repeat the next minute
And for those of you that showed up late, um, we will be sharing the recording of this online. So keep an eye out for it. We'll put it in that same thread for you guys to uh, look it up. So do I have a good recommendation if, as a source to learn about the mathematical theory of finance? Um, I would say that most textbooks, there's a, definitely going to be quite a bit of um, like text out there on it. And I would say Google and find a, a financial engineering textbook, anything that explains like everything from interest rates and then um, the statistics. So another good place is the quantitative finance CFA course, which is basically a statistics course. So I would say the math you should focus on is probably statistics and probabilities. And then also just accounting and making sure that you're able to do bookkeeping within your algorithm. So do I use any other tools while developing algos? Hmm. I would have to say I use Quantopian mostly um, as far as the research platform just because the data is expensive. And a lot of it is just reading and sort of finding an idea. There's a lot of, so SSRN is a database of academic papers and prowling around on there. Another one is uh, quantpapers.com. They have hundreds of papers on trading strategies and just different uh, academic papers that are out there. So those are always good to peruse through. And then a uh, simple one to get started. I feel like pairs trading has worked fairly well in my experience. And that's a one that's easy to wrap your head around if you're trying to get started. And how do you know a buy only algo is getting it right during a bull market? You don't really. <laughs> um, that's a good question. I mean, I feel like the real trick is knowing, being able to perform whether the market's going up or down. So I would suggest looking into things that aren't buy only, long only, and start playing with long short strategies just because they are more ro robust in the long term. Um, another thing with like momentum algorithms I've found, you have to make sure that you're doing things like um, sanity checks. Uh, if you get a signal, you're not going to want to immediately act on it only because if the movement is against you, you're going to end up getting a, a terrible fill. And so for example, if you're short on something, and then the price spikes up, it could be a bad price print and your algorithm's gonna dump at that price basically. If it's like a, a short term uh, event, I had this happen with a short position on VXX where it pops like four or 5% in a minute and then the algorithm bailed and of course whoever's on the other side of that is more than happy to accept that trade. But if it's a reversion strategy, when the price spikes up, it's going to look to short it. And at worst, you're just not going to get a fill. So momentum algorithms require a little bit more uh, you know, checking to make sanity checks. I think that's an important piece. All right. What else we got? So resources to find algorithms. So I'll go to just quantopian.com. We've got the threads there and go to the community section. And there's always tons of activity on here and people are always sharing algorithms. So the best of my algos, let's see. And you can go here and now you'll get a little blurb about it. I am satisfied and you can view the source code and then clone the algorithm. 
And when, by cloning it, that's going to bring it into your own little interactive developing environment where I can now work on it and run my own back tests. So I would definitely suggest looking there. When will futures data be available? Good question. Um, we're hoping not too far out. We've done a lot of uh, code merges to get that into Zipline because anytime we add features, we have to make sure that they're back testable. So futures is getting close, but I'm not positive as to a solid date for when the data will be available. And the link to of the record will be on the same thread on Quantopian. Afterwards, we do I do not have a link to it yet. So is there documentation or example using external local data source? Um, you can go to, let's see, we can, the API reference. And we'll have a whole set of um, docs here. And what you're going to want to look for is this fetcher tool. So fetcher is where you're going to have any, uh, you can host your data on, I guess copy.com is an easy one, uh, Dropbox and things like that, and you can load any CSV data you'd like. And so I would go to quantopian.com forward slash help. That's where you're going to get the documentation as to how that works. And then also if you run into issues, you can just post your issues on the threads and somebody will help, be more than happy to help you out. And the available library, so also same page. We have module import, and these are the current um, whitelisted modules we have, the libraries available. And I believe there's actually some others that are not on here, but these are the ones that are currently available for import that you can use within the back testing and research environments. Um, okay, so why does Q value a low beta? Um, I know that beta is an easy way to uh, easy to achieve by buying S and P contracts in mass, but wouldn't it also be uh, just as easy to short the S and P to get beta down? Um, absolutely. So low beta is about reducing correlations. So if we beta is your primary risk factor in the market, which is just the market itself. And institutional investors can get beta exposure very easily, like you said, by buying S&P contracts. Um, but they don't need us for that. So what a hedge fund is looking to do is provide a diversification product to institutional investors. So if I can go to them with this new product that has low beta and they can add it to their portfolio without worrying how it's going to affect what they currently have going on. So from the institutional uh, investor standpoint, they don't want beta exposure because they already have it. They want things that are additive that they can just um, plug in and not have to worry about uh, how that's going to affect everything else they already have. Does that answer that question?
So could you explain how to read the results of the simulations? What indexes are you looking at when you read the result? All right. So the benchmark is S&P 500, SPY in this case. And within the algorithm itself, you can actually use a function called set benchmark. which will, and you would just put it in this initialized portion. Oh, what's going on? So here you could actually just be like set benchmark and then, ah. And then we should have a pop-up for you. So benchmark, and then if you wanted, you know, Tesla, it would be, I guess you'd have to do it. and then add a symbol. So the benchmark itself is configurable and then you can run a back test here and your new benchmark will be the one, whatever you've put in there. And then the rest of these are um, just your risk metrics. They're all cumulative across the entire back test. And you can also break it down into the by month, one month, three months, uh, six month, 12 month. And we've got the benchmark, treasury, um, volatility, and several metrics uh, on this time series. And then you can also look at your transaction details. And in this case, there's tons. So each on the first day, there's 7,800 transactions. And this will give you a breakdown of what they were at. Was it a buy, sell, how many? And then also your daily position gains and losses will be broken down as well. And then you can also add logging statements, which would then be output here. And I do not believe, yeah, I didn't do any logging within this algorithm. Does that answer your question? Uh, so does Quantopian support arbitrary Python modules? Uh, quick answer, no, because there's security issues and we have to specifically whitelist anything that goes on to the servers just for security reasons. And we got to be really careful with security because anytime you're dealing with uh, money, ultimately, it we're a, a high value target. I would suppose, so we do not support arbitrary Python modules. Can you set multiple benchmarks? No, um, I, I do not believe so. You can run uh, back tests with different benchmarks. And then another way to do that would be to look at um, using research, pulling the get, using get back test to pull in the results of the back test and then compare them um, against however many benchmarks you would like to there. Um, so, Angela says, majored in computer science and good at C++ and Java, not familiar with Python. What modules or library would you recommend me to see? I would definitely say NumPy. So, NumPy and Pandas are the primary mathematical libraries and numerical libraries that Python has. And Pandas is heavily used within the Quantopian infrastructure. So whenever you use the history function to pull in historical data, it's going to return a pandas data frame. So I would say that those are the most um, useful data structures to learn. And they're also very simple. So it's like you can get the standard deviations by saying like data frame dot STD and then mean, so dot mean. So there's a lot of statistical uh, functions that are just baked right into pandas. So I would say look there. 
So how can someone reduce volatility in an algorithm? Um, reducing volatility is about reducing exposures to any single thing. So if I want to, uh, basically hedging is the answer to that. If I don't want to be exposed all along on the market, I might hedge out some of the uh, risk by shorting an index or something like that. That's a good, uh, fairly common way to reduce volatility is to hedge using short positions. And then also reducing leverage. You can do things like weighting according to how volatile the stocks are. So if you divide out the um, standard deviations, uh, instead of using like an even weighted, evenly weighted portfolio, you can weight it inversely to the volatility of the stocks and that should bring down some of the uh, portfolio volatility. Does that answer your question, Calvin? So is there a way to run optimizations? Um, good question. So using um, the research platform, you can also use the zipline library, which is what runs these back tests. And then, so you would have to do a few small changes to create a back test within the research environment. But there you can run optimizations by setting a, a running them over a range of parameters and uh, just do the back tests in a loop. So what is the meaning of Sortino ratio? Let's go to And it looks like it is. Um, okay, so I believe this one is it's kind of like a sharp ratio, but it does not punish for downside deviation. Let's see. Yeah, target semi deviation. So it's downside deviation. It's basically a sharp ratio that doesn't punish you for upside deviation, only the downside. So is Quantopian able to attract high net worth investors or traders despite um, the semi-transparent model. Um, yes, we've actually been getting a lot of like startup hedge fund shops that are adopting the platform just because we take care of a lot of the, the plumbing that is required whenever you're trying to algorithmically trade. So we've got an entire team of engineers here making sure that data is always coming in, that things are working. We've got a lot of software testing in place that costs a lot of money to develop. So we have been getting some uh, pretty good amount of capital being traded on the platform now. And it's also, as far as the semi-transparent, we never look at algorithms unless we're explicitly told we can. So it's a, your IP is always your IP and nobody's going to look at your algorithms. So I do think that it's a matter of trust and I think we are earning it. And at least I hope we are. And is Quantopian ever going to charge fees? As of right now, no. Um, it goes against the model just because we are trying to find quality trading strategies and invest. We want to pay our users based on their performance rather than, so if we introduce a fee structure, it becomes um, counterproductive because we're trying to get as much activity on the platform as possible. Um, that being said, in the future, there could possibly be, but I have no um, 
no idea. Maybe if people opt out of being in the fund at all, we might have to charge a fee, but there's no talk about that currently. So can I talk about um, the data we provide? How does it differ from what's available to the general public? So the data we provide is minute bar equities data going back to um, 2002. And that's expensive data. So I would say that's how it differs. Most people have you know end of day Yahoo Finance data that they are working with. And in addition to that, we've got so fundamentals, fundamental data from Morningstar. And that is going to have you know, roughly 600 metrics that you can query a database for. Everything from your you know, Morningstar's industry codes and then uh, book values, cash returns, market cap. So we have fundamental data as well. And that's pretty uh, unique, I would say, as far as a quant trading platform to be able to do point in time database uh, of fundamentals. And we will be soon to provide futures data once we roll that out. So does Quantopian's data eliminate survivorship bias? Um, yes, we have a, our database includes all stocks that have been delisted or changed tickers, mergers, acquisitions, and all that. So we do eliminate survivorship bias. And it can actually make um, dynamic universe trading strategies much more difficult, so that's a, a good a good feature for us to does Q license their platform out to other funds um, no we don't but we have we have funds that use the platform so there's no we don't have to license it out just because they can be um, Quantopian users and trade their own accounts. And we do have some uh, startup funds that use Quantopian for that purpose. So how can you access historical fundamental data? Um, right now, there's no history equivalent to the fundamentals data. But what you can do is within the research environment, you can do a, let's see if I have an example notebook. So I posted this on uh, China and Greece recently. And this will sh um, does query our fundamentals database and gets a time series. So using research is the easiest way to go about that right now. And right here, so you have to pass in get fundamentals and then a query and then also a date. So this is doing it in a for loop. So I'm doing date, get fundamentals for that date. And then I got monthly time series data. And let's see, so this is like the, um, rolling market caps of Greece versus China. So you can um, use the research platform to get historical fundamental data. But as of right now, there's no easy way to get it within the algorithms other than using a context variable to store them as they come along. Does that answer your question, Calvin?
Yes, and back to the Sortino. It doesn't punish the upside volatility. That's the primary difference. Um, let's see. Okay, I don't think I have any more questions unless there's uh, any more keep rolling in. Feel free, I'll be here for a few more minutes. And thanks for coming out. Appreciate it. I hope you guys got something out of this. And definitely check out the research platform and start playing around with that. It's a awesome tool to be able to research pretty much anything that query our databases